So finding an upper and a lower Riemann sum is actually extremely simple. We're going to take the most simple choice you could possibly have for the dissection of the interval x to x plus h, which is we're going to make absolutely no cuts at all. So the only subinterval we're going to have is the entire interval. So the upper Riemann sum for this incredibly simple choice of dissection, and just for simplicity I'm just going to denote that u, is going to be the length of the subinterval, which is h, times, now because the function is going to be continuous everywhere over the subinterval, as it's continuous everywhere over the whole interval a, b, then it will obey the extreme value theorem, it will be bounded above and below, and it will actually obtain its maximum and minimum. So it's going to have a maximum value, uh, which will be the supremum. So it's h times the maximum value that f obtains over this interval. Similarly, the lower Riemann sum, which I'll just denote l, is going to be the length of the interval h times, and then it will have a minimum value, which will be the infimum. So the minimum value the function obtains over this interval. So putting these values in for my upper and lower Riemann sums, I then get this inequality that the integral from x to x plus h, f of t dt, is sandwiched in between these two values, h times the minimum value that the function obtains over the interval x to x plus h, and then h times the maximum value that the function obtains over the interval. And of course, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to divide through by h, or multiply through by its multiplicative inverse. h is greater than zero, we're assuming, for this first simple part, so its multiplicative inverse, one over h, is also going to be greater than zero, so I can multiply everything by one over h and not have to change the signs of the inequalities. So doing that, it produces this, so I now have that one over h of my integral, which of course is my overall function here, is sandwiched in between the maximum value that the function obtains and the minimum value that the function obtains. Now, where do I go next? Well, remember that my entire little interval from x to x plus h is inside of this delta interval. And remember that the value that the function obtains in the delta interval is always inside this epsilon interval around f of x. So, the maximum value that the function is going to obtain in this interval x to x plus h has to be inside this interval. Similarly, the minimum value that it obtains is going to be inside this interval. Hence, I can conclude that the maximum of f is strictly less than f of x plus epsilon, and the minimum of f is strictly greater than f of x minus epsilon, and therefore I will get that this has to be inside this interval. So writing this out, I know that the maximum value that f obtains over this interval has to be inside there, because after all it obtains it at some point that's inside this interval, and that point is inside the delta interval around x, and therefore obeys this. So maximum of f must be inside of here, therefore it is strictly less than f of x plus epsilon, because if it was greater or equal to this, then it wouldn't fall inside this interval. Similarly, I can conclude that the minimum of f is strictly greater than f of x minus epsilon, because if it was um, less than it or equal to it, then it would not fall inside this interval. And you can now see that my overall function here is sandwiched in between this value below and this value above, and therefore must fall inside that interval from f of x minus epsilon to f of x plus epsilon. So we now need to consider h values that are less than zero and prove that the same argument holds true. So h is now less than zero, we'll do it over on this side. Mod of h, of course, is still less than delta. And again, we're just going to consider the integral part. We're going to get rid of the one over h initially. And for simplicity, let's put the bounds of the integral the correct way round for now. So we'll put x plus h on the bottom and x at the top. So x plus h, remember, is less than x if h is less than zero. On the picture, here is x plus h now, less than x here. And remember, if mod of h is less than delta, then that means that x plus h is still going to lie inside this delta interval around x. And we're assuming that our x point is one where negative h values is relevant. So all but this lower bound of the interval a. So we will now apply the same argument as we used previously to this integral from x plus h to x of f of t dt, which is that it will be less than or equal to any upper Riemann sum for that function over that interval, and greater than or equal to any lower Riemann sum 
for that function over that interval. And we will again take the simplest possible dissection to construct an upper and lower Riemann sum with, which is the dissection that we make no additional cuts. So we just have one subinterval, which is the entire interval, so the interval x plus h to x, which will have length modulus h. Now that's a crucial change here. h, remember, is a negative number, so the length for that subinterval will be of modulus h. So the upper Riemann sum over that interval for the function will be the maximum value the function obtains over it times modulus of h, and the lower Riemann sum will be the minimum value the function obtains over it times the modulus of h. So now we have our integral here bounded, sandwiched in between these two values. So because mod of h is a positive number, we can divide through by it without changing the signs of the inequalities, and that's what I've done here. So we get that... 1 over the mod of h times the integral from x plus h to x of f of t dt is greater than or equal to minimum of f and less than or equal to maximum of f. Next, what we can do is just a few little manipulations to this. So we can replace mod of h with minus h because we're assuming h is less than 0. So mod of h is just minus h. So that turns this thing into minus 1 over h times the integral from x plus h to x of f of t dt. And now we can apply the definition that we made earlier in the video and switch around the bounds here of the integral and swallow that minus sign in. So this becomes is equal to 1 over h times the integral from x to x plus h, which of course is an integral with the bounds the wrong way around because this one is less than this one, f of t dt. And you can see now that we've got the same inequality as we had with the positive h's for the negative h's, this thing, which is our overall function, remember, back up here, is less than or equal to the maximum value that the function obtains over the interval, well, x plus h to x, in the case of h is negative, and greater than or equal to the minimum value that the function obtains over that interval. But then the same argument now holds true for this interval to the left of x, as held true for the interval to the right of x, because the mod of h is less than delta, all of the values x prime, let's call them, inside that interval from x plus h to x are inside the delta interval around x. So therefore fall inside of this interval from f of x minus epsilon to f of x plus epsilon. Hence, this maximum value and this minimum value over here are inside that interval. So this exact same inequality is going to hold true. The value of our function is going to be sandwiched in between f of x minus epsilon below and f of x plus epsilon above. So it's time now for a summary of what we've managed to do here. So we started with our x point that was somewhere inside our domain, which is the interval a, b. And then we took an epsilon greater than zero and we applied continuity of the original function f at that point x to say that there then exists a delta greater than zero, such that if you look at the delta interval around that point x, so this interval, and you consider the points that are actually relevant to your domain where the function f is actually defined, then the value of the function for those points is going to be inside the epsilon interval around f of x. What we have then managed to do is show that if you take an h value, which is modulus less than this delta and is relevant to your domain, so takes you to a value that is still inside your domain a, b, and in the case of the picture, any of those h values are going to keep you inside the domain, but in the case of the boundary points, it will have to be an h in one specific direction, so for the a value here, it will have to be a positive h, and for the b value here, it will have to be a negative h. Then, if you look at the value of this function, 1 over h times the integral from x to x plus h f of t dt for both positive and negative h's that are less than modulus delta and keep you in the domain, it is the case that this will be inside the interval f of x minus epsilon to f of x plus epsilon. Hence, this delta that we found from continuity satisfies this and since we didn't specify what this epsilon was other than saying it was greater than zero, it's then possible to do for all epsilon greater than zero. So it does hold true that for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta such that this is satisfied. Hence, it is true to say that the limit as h approaches zero of this is indeed f of x.
So we have therefore proven the first fundamental theorem of calculus. We'll take a break here and in the next part we'll prove the second fundamental theorem of calculus.